So one of the things during my time on YouTube that I have just been excited about and very proud of this channel for is the fact that every time that I give you an opinion on a camera, on a lens, I give you that opinion only after I've used it on a paid assigned professional shoot, meaning I don't believe that I should be allowed to give you opinion on a camera. No one should be allowed to on a camera or a lens if they haven't used it in a situation to where if that camera or that lens fails, it would cost them. I believe that things should be put in real world use to be able to give you real world ideas. I don't believe that looking at a spec sheet should be what you go off of when making a purchase because camera manufacturers lie. And so I'm proud to say that in every single review that you see coming from this channel, I have, yes, tested fully and used for more than just a week or two, every single piece of gear that I've ever spoken about. And I've given you my honest opinion on it, whether good or bad, whether I get um, you know rebuffed from Fujifilm or from other camera manufacturers or not. And the reason why I'm saying this is because the camera that I'm talking about today, Fujifilm's X-H1, is a camera that I not only believe is the best value out there right now for cameras. You can get the body for 500, and you can get the body with a battery grip for around 700, but I also believe that it is one of the greatest forgotten flagships ever. It's a camera that for 99% of people, it is more than enough camera to get a lot of your things done. And for those who actually hate this camera and don't like it, they didn't enjoy it because of user error or they've never used it in their life, but they still had an opinion. Because if you've used this camera, Fujifilm's X-H1, and you've grown to love it in some way, shape, or form. It's capable, it's fast, and Fujifilm's updates after this thing was rolled out um, prior to the X-T3, they weren't that great. This camera wasn't really turning any heads, but the updates that it got after the X-T3 rolled out and everyone started to bury this camera, not only made it a comparable pick, but also in many ways shaped and formed the way that Fujifilm started making cameras from there on out. So when it comes to this camera, there's a few things that people like to bring up on saying this is an inferior camera. And we'll touch on each and every single one of those. Whether it's the log profile, which again, for the life of me, I don't understand why people are so afraid of 8-bit, but they're accepting of 10-bit 420 when there's not a huge difference. And most people, when they're recording, oddly enough, won't invest in an external monitor like an Atomos Ninja V to be able to get the most out of their cameras. Whether it's the autofocus, which I can tell you from personal experience, I've used this for professional sports, I've used this for portrait sessions, for video, recording documentaries. The autofocus is great, thanks to Fujifilm giving fantastic updates to this camera after the X-T3 was released. This camera was actually able to do a lot of fantastic things, and right now, no matter what anyone says, I've used both of them side by side, even recently, the X-H1 and the X-T3 autofocus is comparable in every situation. So my mic died, so I spent about another 15 minutes blabbing on about this camera and telling you all the things about it that are fantastic without it getting recorded. So allow me to step in and say them right now. You see, this camera is not only the grandfather of so many things that we love about Fujifilm cameras right now, but this camera still holds up in 2023, especially, and I mean this specifically, if you're someone who knows what you're doing in photography and videography. You don't have to be an expert, but you just have to be someone that knows more than just the basics. We have to stop blaming gear when it comes to our photography and videography, and we have to start blaming ourselves if we're not getting the results that we want. Yeah, some sensors do better in low light than others. Yes, some sensors and some processors are able to autofocus better, but at the same time, it's up to you to be able to adjust and still be able to overcome in those situations or have the necessary gear to be able to capture what you're supposed to capture. Let's start with how this is the first X series body with IBIS in it. And the IBIS is damn good. Now, I know people expect every single time that you have any kind of IBIS that it needs to be able to be gimbal certified. It's gonna look like I'm walking around with the Steadicam, I'm walking around with the chest rig, etc., etc. But that's not true. This, if you have the slightest um, steady hand with a 23 f2, an 18 to 55, which is a OIS lens, even a 16 to 55, which is kind of heavy. This camera is going to do more than enough. It's going to be fantastic. And we have to stop holding this expectation to older gear that, oh, the IBIS is just okay. Whenever we can't still get the same gimbal steady shots out of the X-H2S, out of any Sony camera, and out of a lot of Canon cameras up to, I think the R3 has done a pretty good job. Um, we're not still getting gimbal steady shots like that. If you want gimbal steady shots in your IBIS, go ahead and buy a gimbal. 
But when it comes to this being usable with having it around your neck, being able to hold uh, handheld and being able to get fantastic shots in both video and in photo using the in-body image stabilization, this camera checks the boxes. And again, for about five, $600, being able to get IBIS and a camera like this with the amazing ergonomics, that's a win. Let me touch on autofocus one more time to bash this into your head. The autofocus in this is not bad. A lot of people at the beginning, and even right now when people say, should you get an X-T3 or an X-T4, will tell you, well, if you don't need the IBIS, just get an X-T3 because the autofocus isn't that far off from the X-T3 to the X-T4. Well, I hate to break it to you, but the autofocus on this camera compared to the X-T3 is damn near identical. I use it for professional sports, for professional video, for being able to have client commercial work, and this thing worked fantastic. And again, it is very, very, I've tested them side by side or used them, didn't even have to test them. Used them side by side, X-T3 and this X-H1. I had them both in my hands at the same time with an X-T4 that Fujifilm had sent me. And there is no discernible difference when you're doing everyday average things. Now, if I run back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, side to side, and I'm trying to test this camera and confuse it, yeah, this probably will do worse than both of those. But how many of you guys that are shooting professional talking head or that are shooting just regular weddings and things like that are gonna have a bride and groom sprint at you full speed and then sprint backwards? It doesn't make any sense that we judge autofocus like that. Portrait photographers, unless your person taking a portrait is sprinting at you full speed like the get out scene with the running at nighttime, you're gonna be just fine. And listen, I'm just gonna say, if us DSLR shooters and us film shooters from back of the day are still able to be, or were able to be successful back in the day and acquire focus, this is more than enough. And honestly, this is like kind of overkill whenever it comes to, do I need it? Is it gonna be good enough? Yes, it is. It's gonna focus on your eye. You're gonna get a sharp shot. If you don't, you should probably work on figuring out how to adjust your ISO and your shutter speed. Stop blaming cameras for blurry shots when a lot of times it's the user. Last thing I wanna talk about, I'm very, very passionate about. The processing for video in this camera. This is an eight bit camera. The log is only eight bit. I understand that is very, very concerning for a lot of you. But listen, I have always been able to create fantastic things out of eight bit codec. And I need you to hear me. I have always been able to create fantastic things out of 8-bit codec, whether in a Sony A7 whatever, whether this camera right here, before 10-bit became the popular norm, guess what? If you were hired to do videography and all you had was a camera that did 8-bit, you had to create fantastic images using 8-bit and no one ever complained about if colors fall apart, if, if, if shadows and highlights fall apart before 10-bit came along. And let me tell you something, the only people that I know that struggled when 10-bit, 8-bit, and all that discussion started happening, which is better, why you should always get a 10-bit camera, the only people that I know that struggled with 8-bit and would tell you that it's falling apart are people that don't know how to expose for log. And that goes back to no matter what you're doing, you can't blame the camera, it's on you. The difference between 8-bit codec and 10-bit 420 codec, which is inside the X-T3, listen, it's only 10-bit 420, the X-T3 and the X-T4, 10-bit 420, not 422. The difference is negligible. And honestly, I need you guys to understand that instead of spending more money to get to a camera that has a higher codec that you might actually probably won't ever take full advantage of if you don't know how to expose and color grade and you're just gonna slap a lot on there and call it good, it's not worth that money. You might as well pocket that money and do something like I did, which was take a master class with a guy named Denver Riddle to learn in DaVinci and in Final Cut Pro how to edit log footage, whether 8-bit, 10-bit, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing for S-log, C-log, F-log. You have the same principles that you have to follow using zebras, false colors, all these different things to help you out. Slapping a LUT on 8-bit and it not working because you underexpose your image doesn't constitute the camera being bad or the footage and the log footage being bad in that camera. The same way that if I was to overexpose my log footage in a Sony A1 S-log3 by five stops or underexposed by three stops and I can't pull back all the color, all the shadow, all the highlight. I can't blame the A1. It has to be me. It was always the same about these. Yeah, the X-T3 had a lot of bells and whistles. Yeah, at launch it had a faster autofocus system and at launch a lot of people were enamored with 10-bit. But that's marketing. And honestly, I can make magic out of this camera without 10-bit and so can you. Don't be intimidated by 8-bit, 
10-bit codecs and things like that, especially doing something like this for YouTube or commercial work for and videography whenever it comes to social media. Why? Compression takes place first, and if you know how to um, expose any of your footage, you're gonna have a great time. The images that come out of this are nice and clean. I've told you guys before, one of my favorite sensors of all time live inside of this. It is a nice and soft light, feels like it's wrapping around you. I love this camera. It is fantastic, especially for video. And I wish a lot of people would lay off it because again, majority of people that said this isn't a good camera for video never shot any video with this camera. I'm pretty sure the average person just taking photos of friends and families, of just taking wildlife stationary photos, the average person taking photos of cars that are not driving, just sitting there, the average person who's taking portraits of people, this is going to work. And that's why it never really sits well with me how people criticize cameras so much. Listen, I understand portrait photography is a big deal, but at the same time, there's not much going on. And I'm telling you, if anything uh, previous from DSLRs like the 5D Mark II, um, and you have your lenses calibrated correctly, and you're shooting on anything 5D Mark II age and above, and you're not able to hit focus in a portrait session, it's not the camera unless there's a huge malfunction. It is you. It's you. It's you. If you're a wedding photographer, and a lot of wedding photographers will be able to agree with this, if you were good with the X-T2, the X-T3, and now you hear people talking about, oh, you know what, the X-H1, the X-T4, uh, those aren't good enough for weddings, does that not make, does that not crawl underneath your skin? Because it's all just an excuse to not get the shot. It's all just an excuse to upgrade. I get it, there are some things that are incremental huge upgrades. Upgrading from the X-T3 to the X-H2 or the X-T5 or the X-H2S is a huge jump, huge jump. But people forget that just a couple of weeks ago, they are able to do the exact same work with that X-T3. And yeah, you can look at your hit rate and say, oh, it's 10% better. But were you really struggling and not able to keep yourself afloat before you got that camera? No. Marketing and gear acquisition syndrome are such a big deal to us that we lie and we make stuff up about these cameras. This is probably the third time I've purchased this camera. This camera will always be a camera I come to whenever I have a string of video uh, type things that need to be made. In fact, this is going to be a second camera that I have for events coming up that I can have a second shooter use or that I can have shooting B-roll because this is perfect. I put it in Eterna profile. I record right over here on my Atomos Ninja V. I have someone running and gutting or I'm running and gutting. The focus is perfect. I can use manual focus lenses adapted onto it if I want to, but more than anything, it just performs. And at the end of the day, what's always funny to me is people always say, I'm a professional or real professionals just need cameras that work at all times. And when you say, hey, this camera works at all time because it's not brand new, people get mad. Why would you spend money on that when you could spend a couple hundred dollars more and well, not everyone has a couple hundred dollars more. Or even more than that, not everyone is dumb enough to spend a couple hundred dollars more on a body and thinks that that will make them a better photographer instead of investing in a lens, instead of investing in food for their children, instead of investing in a damn haircut. All right, it's very, very simple. The camera works. It's a great camera, it's a badass camera. And right now, everywhere you go, I'm starting to see these go with a battery grip and three batteries for sub $700. Go out and get one of these. And for the people that bitch and wanna cry and moan about, oh, you're raising the price. Listen, I'm not raising shit. The prices are always gonna raise. It's you dum-dums who are out there buying an X100V for $1,800, $1,900, or trying to sell your XE3 for $800 that I hope the worst for. And honestly, I hope nothing but bad things happen to you because I don't drive up the price. I just give you honest opinions. It's you guys that can't be patient and wait and buy things at a reasonable price and get scalped and get scammed that are to blame. Don't shoot the messenger, shoot the dumbass right in the check. This right here, is a great first cam, main cam, A cam, only cam. Stop believing all the BS you hear and the negativity you hear on the internet whenever it comes to these cameras. So with all that being said, check out this camera. You're probably gonna love it. And take it light, but take it. Have a good one.